as usual. It's a great to be with you here on 105.1 Life FM, Bendy Gator's Positive Choice. It's just coming up to 2 p.m. and it's my delight as usual to welcome Ruth Webb from the Tabernacle of David. Good to see you, Ruth. Good to see you, Peter, and welcome to everybody today. Well, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible tells us that God is Elohim. He's the God above all gods and he is the creator. Genesis begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a very foundational, important understanding. And Revelation 4 says, Lord, you deserve to receive glory, honor and power because you created everything. Everything came into existence and was created because of your will. We know the news and social media is full of warnings about climate change. There's lots of debates about it. But what does the Bible say about it? Is there an emergency? Now, I tell you, I'm not a scientist and I'm not going to talk about the science. But I am going to look at what the scripture says, what the scriptures have to say. Now, we understand that scientists and governments are saying there's destructive weather, unprecedented fires and historic famines, causing devastation to homes and environments all over the world, causing poverty and inequality. And their answer is that it's the overuse of certain fuels with CO2. But the Bible is also filled with lots of instances of droughts and floods and issues with food supply and weather disturbances that affect populations, even wiping them out. So what reason does the Bible give? And I believe we need to understand that as the debates go on in the world, we need to know what is the scripture saying? You know, is it just fluctuations? Is it whatever it is? I know in my lifetime, I've experienced hotter summers. I know in Uluru, it used to once be a tropical rainforest, but I'm not here to discuss that today. I want to look at and to reinforce the biblical understanding. God is the creator. He is the beginning and he is the end. He created everything and he rules. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 21 to 28, it says, Who has measured the water of the sea with the palm of his hand or measured the sky with the length of his hand? Now just think about that. Look at the palm of your hand, cup it, and imagine all the water of the earth filling it. That's God's hand. Or measuring the universe or the sky from your thumb to your little finger. That's that's God measuring the universe. And then it goes on and says, Who's held the dust of the earth in a bushel basket or weighed the mountains on a scale and the hills on a balance? My kitchen scales would not hold all the hills and the mountains of the earth. And yet that's what it's saying in a basket or, or on the scales. In verse 15 of Isaiah 40 says, The nations are like a drop in the bucket. Now my bucket holds 10 litres, a general um, plastic bus- bucket. And the Lord says the nations are like a drop in a bucket. Just a drop. Not half full, just a drop. And there's no hole in the bucket. And there's no hole in the bucket, that's right. Because he's holding the bucket. And that's the important thing for us to understand. And then it says in verse 21, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? God is enthroned above the earth. And those who live on it are like grasshoppers. To the Lord, we're like little grasshoppers running around. He stretches out the sky like a canopy and stretches it out like a tent to live in. He makes rulers unimportant and earthly judges worth nothing compared to him. To whom then would you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. And that's what I believe the Lord wants us to do today. Lift up our eyes. Know that the Lord is the creator. He's the king of the universe. He's the Holy One who rules 
over the earth. He has authority over all the elements. He provides rain and sunshine and food. And we know that Jesus had authority over the elements. He calmed the storms. He walked on water. He created water, uh, wine out of water. He fed the multitudes. And the response that the Lord wants from us, from all of creation, is to praise him, to bow and worship him. Yes, Lord, all your works shall praise him. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. For the Son created everything, both in the heavenly realm and on earth, all that is seen and all that is unseen, every seat of power, realm of government and principality and authority. It was all created by him and for his purpose. Let everyone worship this awe-inspiring creator. Let the entire universe erupt in praise to God. From nothing to something he spoke and created it all. Let the whole earth join in with this parade of praise. Praise him. Let all creation join in with this orchestra of praise. I will extol you. My heart bows in worship to you, my King and my God. Lord, you are great and worthy of the highest praise. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and we, your saints, shall bless you. We shall speak of your glory, of your kingdom, and talk of your power. To make known the mighty acts and glorious majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. You manifest yourself as kindness in all you do. Your love is wrapped into all your works. Everyone, everywhere, lift your voice in praise. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Praise Him with the sound of trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and harp, with stringed instruments and flute. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Come, saints of the living God. Join this orchestra of praise. Lift your voice and sing praise to the King of Kings. Shall praise your name, O Lord. 
The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah. He shall reign for ever and ever. The twenty-four elders who sit by God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God. We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and is to come. You have taken your great power and reigned. Let our praise rise to the King of the universe, who is indestructible, invisible, full of glory, the only God who is worthy of highest honor throughout all time and eternity. Come, saints, come, bless his holy name. He is the mighty God. He is the creator. He is the ruler of all things. And the Bible tells us from Genesis to Revelation of his authority over weather, over food supply. But what does the Bible say about its cause? Does the Bible mention CO2? Well, not exactly. But let's start with the Garden of Eden. In the first three chapters of Genesis, all was paradise, no problems at all, until Adam sinned. And in chapter 3, God spoke to Adam and in verse 17 said, because, so that gives you the, the because, the reason 
is because you obeyed your wife instead of me and ate fruit from the forbidden tree when I commanded you not to. The ground will be cursed because of you. You will eat of it through painful toil all the days of your life. The ground will grow thorns and thistles. You will painfully toil and sweat to produce food to eat. Now it's really important to notice that work is not the curse. Prior to the fall, Adam worked. He was both a zookeeper and a farm manager. He had dominion of everything in the Garden of Eden. He worked, but the food source came quite freely. But now, after his sin, the ground itself was cursed. And now food production would be really tough. It would be painful. So why is the ground cursed? Because of disobedience to the voice of God. And that's the important thing to notice here. It's disobedience to what God said. Because we know that Jesus bore a crown of thorns to break the curse. And that's a really important part of redemption. But now we go on to the next generation of Cain and Abel. And the thing is that generally we reap what we sow and when we are sowing, it can increase. In Genesis 4, we know that Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. Abel's offering was accepted by God and Cain's offering was rejected. And God spoke to Cain and warned him that he was in danger. But did Cain listen to God? Well, verse 10 we get the answer. Yahweh asked, what have you done? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the ground, which has received the blood of your brother whom you killed. When you farm the ground, it will no longer yield its best for you. So like Adam, the ground itself is now cursed. Why? disobedience to God's voice or ignoring God's voice. He's reaping what he's sown. Adam was formed from the dust of the earth and he ate from a tree grown from the ground against God's word. Now Cain, a farmer, offers something from the ground that's not acceptable to God and he murders his brother and the blood soaks the ground so that the ground is cursed and can no longer farm. So we see that the production of food is because of the disobedience of man to God. Now we come to Noah, and we know the story of Noah. So what caused the flood? Was it climate change? Well, in Genesis chapter 6, it says, Heavenly beings married women and had children. The Nephilim, or giants, were on the earth in those days. And Yahweh saw how evil humans had become on the earth. Yahweh was sorry he had made humans and was heartbroken. Elohim saw the, earth, the world and how corrupt it was because all people on earth lived evil lives. There's an understanding that where Adam's sin released sin of, uh, you know, into our DNA, that the Nephilim, the giants, actually taught mankind total corruption and perversion. That, that there's two falls in a sense. There's the fall of Adam. But the, the, what happened with the giants is they actually taught perversion to mankind. And so we know the story of the flood. And in chapter 7 of Genesis, verse 12, it says, Man's wickedness caused God's hand. There's the cause and effect. And God's hand opened the fountains of the subterranean deep to crack open and the floodgates of heaven to open. And that's really important for us to remember and to keep in mind. God is the creator. He has authority over the subterranean deep and the floodgates of heaven. And he rules and has authority. His hand caused the flood and it actually wiped out all of mankind, all the animals, all the, all the species, except that which was saved by God's mercy in the ark. And so when the flood finished, Noah built an altar to the Lord, which we talked about in the last weeks. But God gave an amazing promise to Noah 
and to everyone who follows all the generations that follows afterwards, even to us today. And it's this in Genesis 8.22. The Lord says, as long as the earth exists, there will always, always be seasons of planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. And that's the promise of the Lord. And we need to take hold of that promise in these days as fear tells us there's going to be famine. When fear says this and that, we need to understand God's promise. There will always be seasons for planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Now, in Genesis nineteen twenty four, we know there was a big fire from heaven. And it says in verse 24, Yahweh made burning sulfur and fire rain out of heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we know that was about the whole um, homosexual lifestyle that was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. But remember the story Abraham and Lot divided and separated and Lot chose the fertile plain to go and live in. And so he went down there. So when he went there, it was fertile soil. I can tell you today... Um, I've been there just a few years ago to Sodom and Gomorrah and it's a salt pan. That's the Dead Sea area. It's all salt. And in fact, there's a, a pillar that they suggest is Lot's wife. It may or may not be, but the thing is it's no longer fertile. I can tell you that. I have photographs. I can prove it to you and everyone that goes down there. Is it, con is it climate change? Well, I want to say to you, it's Father's world. He created the world. The world is in his hands. And we are called to live by his rules because he rules. So this beautiful rendition of well, this is my father's world by the Collingswood family. Wow, isn't that glorious? This is my father's world. He created it. He rules over it. And it's interesting how the land is so important to the Lord. And very many times he spoke to Israel. You have defiled my land, he said. Biblically, there are always consequences for sin. And of course, we know there is mercy, God's great mercy, which we'll talk about in a moment. But sin not only impacts people, our souls, but it also impacts the land. In Psalm 106, verse 38, it says, The land became polluted with blood. How? It says in verse 36, They worshipped their idols. They sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons. God's con concern with land contamination is not so much about God's irresponsibility with resources like plastic or coal. His concern is with life because he is the giver of life and if we take life if we mess up life and if we dishonor him with idolatry it brings a defilement isaiah 24 verse 3 makes it very clear it says the earth will be completely laid waste and stripped because yahweh has spoken we know creation came into being because he spoke the word. And here it says in verse 3 of Isaiah 24, the earth will be laid waste because he speaks. And the earth dries up and withers. The earth is polluted by those who live on it because they've disobeyed the Lord's teachings, violated his laws and rejected the everlasting promise. That is why a curse devours the earth. So I've read straight from the scripture in Isaiah 24 that biblically the reason for pollution on the earth is man's dishonor of God and disobedience of the creator. Pollution of land causing weather catastrophes is a result of man worshipping idols, shedding of innocent blood, which in our day is abortion, and the third one, there's always these three. It's worshipping idols, it's shedding of innocent blood, and the third one is sexual immorality and perversion. It activates God's hand. The Bible doesn't speak about mismanagement, even though that it's important to manage the earth. 
That is important. But what really upsets the Lord and what causes him to for the earth to be affected and polluted is sin. And in fact, in Leviticus 18, it uses such strong language. It says the land will vomit you out of it. I mean, that's, that's graphic. In verse 4, he says, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Live by my standards and obey my rules. You will have life through them. So that's the other side. He promises life if we follow his commands, if we obey him. He says, I am Yahweh. And then he goes on and he lists all these sexual perversions and the sacrificing of children to Moloch. And in verse 24, he says, By these practices, the land has become unclean. I will punish it for its sins. The land will vomit out those who live in it. Live by my standards, obey my rules. If you make the land unclean, it will vomit you out as it has with those who were there before you. So the bloodshed of children, which the Israelites did to the god Moloch, and they put the children into a fire, today we do the same thing, similar demonic power, but it's generally abortion is the major one. Sexual immorality and perversion, we know that's full in our, in our culture and idolatry and it dishonors God's name we are created in his image and we defile the land and nations actually disintegrate you know the Roman Empire itself disintegrated because of these sins as history has repeated and repeated consider Egypt the ten plagues God was judging their idols and what did he touch the water supply the food supply and of course the firstborn as well. And so Baal is seen as the god of weather, who's the cloud rider. And all through scripture we see Yahweh as the cloud rider. He is the one who is a way above Baal and he has authority over weather. And that's why when Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal, he contested with them and it, when they built their different altars, Elijah poured water on his altar and he said, it's the God who answers with fire. So they, the Baal worshippers believed that the Baal was the God of thunder, or the God of, of storms, of weather, of, of harvest. But he failed the test because God of Israel, Yahweh, he answered with fire and the altar that was full of water got licked up and, and, and consumed by God. So you say, well, you've told us all the Old Testament scriptures. What about the New Testament? Well, to be honest, there's so much in the New Testament. I'm actually going to leave that till next week in most of it. But there's one scripture I want to talk about in the New Testament, and that's Romans 8. Because it says in Romans 8 that sin impacts all of creation. In fact, it says all of creation groans, awaiting redemption. Let me read it to you from verse 19. All of creation is eagerly waiting for God to reveal who his children are. Creation was subjected fr to frustration. We know that all creation has been groaning with the pains of childbirth up to the present time. However, not only creation groans, we who have the spirit also groan inwardly. We groan as we eagerly wait for our adoption, the freeing of our bodies from sin. We were saved with this hope in mind. I know believers that I'm talking to are groaning in their spirit with what's taking place, but it's not just with what's taking place in the earth. The groaning is waiting for, for Yeshua to come. It's waiting for him to come to put everything in divine order. And it says here in this scripture in Romans 8, all of creation, the land, mankind, the animals, are waiting the freedom when Yeshua comes and brings everything back into divine order. Remember, he is the creator. He is the king. He rules, and it's by his rules. And there are consequences of disobedience upon the man, upon man and land. They're both groaning. But God is so merciful, so merciful, so kind. The sacrifice of Yeshua in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 15, it says, Yeshua is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. He created all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. 
kings, the lords, rulers or powers, everything has been created through him and for him. He existed before everything and holds everything together. Now, these are really powerful scripture. He holds everything together. He created it and existed because at his word and he holds everything together. If you're worried about what's happening to the earth, know it is in his hands. He holds it together. And then it goes on to say in verse 20, and by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. And it's the reference back to the Garden of Eden. And we know that we, as sons of Adam, we're redeemed by the, the Jesus, the second Adam, restored back to that fellowship and intimacy with God that Adam once had. But it's speaking about all of heaven and earth as well being restored. And so that mercy of God is so good. We deserve death. We deserve annihilation. We deserve the earth to be wiped out. But God in his mercy heals, redeems. Who is like him? And there's a beautiful song that Karen Davis sings. Who is like you? Who is like the Lord? He is our creator. He's the king. And as mankind, <clears throat> we need to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is that we obey him. Yet there's promises of God in his mercy that he heals the land. He promises to heal the land. It is conditional, but there are promises. In Psalm 24, verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything it contains. Yahweh claims the world is his. Everything and everyone belong to him. I love Psalm 104. It is a powerful passage about creation. I encourage you to go and read it after this program. Psalm 104, in fact, they, some uh, scholars believe that Psalm 104 actually is a, a psalm, a song of the six days of creation panned out throughout the psalm, which I won't go through. But it starts off in verse 5. You, our creator, formed the earth and you hold it together so it will never fall apart. Now, there's a really powerful word, isn't it? for us to hold on to. The creator formed the earth and he holds it together so it will never fall apart. And there's several covenants made through scripture that are actually based on that fact. For example, in Psalm 89 verse 37, God speaks about his faithfulness as sure as the sun is in the sky. And that was in the, the covenant with David. He said that the promise I'm giving to David and his family is as secure as the sun standing. And to Israel in, in Jeremiah 31, it says the covenant to Israel is the same as to the sun and moon staying in place. And so the Lord is, is comparing that. And he's been faithful all these years. Psalm 104 Verse 9 says, The Lord sets a boundary line for the seas and commanded them not to trespass. He sends springs through the valleys to provide drink for every living thing, men and beasts. And we know that there's times where there's been droughts, but the, the Lord's provision to Elijah by the brook. And there's other scriptures in Isaiah that speak of the desert that, that the Lord would put springs through there. In verse 14 of Psalm 104, God's compassion for all of all of his creation it says your kindness sends the rain. Your compassion brings the earth's harvest, feeding the hungry. You cause the grass to grow for livestock and fruit, grains and vegetables to feed mankind. Verse 19, you made the moon to mark the months and to sun to measure the days. Verse 27, all creatures wait expectantly for you to give them their food as you determine. If you were to withhold from them, they would all panic. And when you choose to take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you release your spirit, when life is created, ready to replenish life upon the earth. 
It's important to understand these scriptures because fear of climate change can say there's going to be a famine, food scarcity, uh, and that gets bandied around and so it creates fear. But in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus clearly says to us, don't be anxious or afraid about food, about drink or clothes. He says, look at the birds of the air, how beautiful they are. And then he says to us, seek first or chase after or make the priority the kingdom of God and all of these things will be given to you in abundance. All of them. Food, drink, clothing, shelter. So he's really speaking that we need to trust him in faith. He is the creator. So it's really a, a, a real encouragement to us in this day when it's being talked about food shortages. I've heard so many, and you probably have too, the many stories of people that have been without food, have prayed, given thanks to the Lord for the food in faith, said grace, and the next minute there's a knock on the door and their meals arrived. And the provisions of God are always there. I love the next part of Psalm 104, verse 32. It shows so clearly the power of God. It says, the finger of the Lord releases volcanoes. Imagine just your finger sets off volcanoes. It says, the earth's overseer has the power to make it tremble. Just a touch of his finger and volcanoes erupt as the earth shakes and melts. Just his finger. You know, it's not very big, is it? Our fingers are not very big, and yet that's what his finger can do. But the promise of God in Second Chronicles seven fourteen is about healing land, and I've talked we've talked about that many times, and we'll just get into that. But I know there are many testimonies, um, particularly in the transformation series, which we'll talk about another day, of when people today have really taken hold of Second Chronicles seven for their communities where there's been sin, where there's been disobedience against God. And when they followed it through, God has healed the land. So the polluted streams are now clean streams. Species that were no longer, you know, had become extinct have returned. Produce that couldn't grow, the curse on the land has been broken. So this is for real even today. So in Second Chronicles 7, we know Solomon was dedicating the temple. He built an altar. They had a huge worship service out with all the musicians and the glory fell. Then Solomon prayed. And when he finished, fire fell from heaven and the glory fell. And the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night. And the Lord says in verse 3, If I, so this is God speaking, If I shut up the sky so there's no rain, If I order locusts to devour the land, or if I send an epidemic of sickness. So he's talking about drought. He's talking about pandemics. He's talking about locusts destroying all the food. And he then says, God sends it. But then he says in the verse 14 that everyone quotes, If my people will humble themselves, seek my face, pray and repent, then I will heal the land. If you will repent, of the sexual immorality and perversion, if you will repent of dishonouring his name with idolatry, if you will repent of bloodshed of the innocents, he will heal the land. Rain, food, locusts, whatever it is, that's caused the problem. Yet in verse 19 to 22, he goes on and says, if you worship other gods, I will uproot you from the land because idolatry brings disaster. But he promises if you repent of it, turn away from it, return to him, he will heal the land. Isaiah 40 verse 28 says, Don't you know, haven't you heard, the eternal God, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, he doesn't grow tired or become weary. His understanding is beyond reach. He gives strength to those who grow tired and increases the strength of those who are weak, even young people. And the strength of those who wait with hope in Yahweh will be renewed. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not become weary and walk and not faint. And Isaiah 43 says, Now, says the Lord who created you and who formed you, 
O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you. I've called you by, my, by your name. You are mine. When you go through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So if there's floods, he says, he will be with us. If there's fires, he will be with us. And powerful, powerful song reminding us from Psalm 46. That was Shane and Shane. The Lord of hosts, you are with us. He's with us in the storm. He's with us in the fiercest battle. And that is, and he's the creator. He's the ruler. He has the authority. He has the power to hold us in it and to deal with it according to his will and purposes because his ways are way above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And so sometimes we think he should stop the storm. But there's other reasons for it. But he says he will take us through it. He will take us through it. And that's why I believe it's really important for us to reassess. He is the creator and to really look at these scriptures and to know that our sin does have an impact upon creation. But he's merciful. <laughs> that's the good news. He's, he's merciful. He is the creator, the beginning and the end. He is king. We know that disobedience, we reap what we sow. And most issues of lack on earth is, is sin-related because creation is groaning. Responsible management is biblical. Laurie and I are both of farms. My parents were dairy farmers. Laurie's parents were wheat, sheep farmers. So we understand, and a lot of farmers are very good, um, responsible managers, really understand the importance of caring for the animals, caring for the environment, being good managers. Adam was called initially to have dominion over the earth to be a farm management. The problem came when he sinned against the voice of the Lord. Irresponsibility itself does have consequences. But when we sin against God and dishonor him, that's when it goes beyond just simple consequences to curses upon the land. And we see the, how it went from where Adam disobeyed the voice of God and it made food production painful, difficult and a toil. But in the case of Cain, where there was bloodshed involved, the consequence was much more severe so that the, it wouldn't even produce even with the toil. And so it's really a good reminder for us today to, to be reminded that he, the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, he holds the earth in his hands. He has power over rain and the sun. He has the authority and he holds it in his hands and even though we sin against him and causes consequences on the earth, his mercy is that Yeshua's blood restores to Eden. He heals the lands. He delivers all of creation from the birth pangs in time. Praise God, we know the end of the story, as we say, because we can know him and trust him as creator, as redeemer, as re and the resurrector, the, the giver of life. He alone is the supplier of all our needs, including food, water, clothes, and shelter. He can turn desert into streams. He has authority over all the elements. Remember the miracles of Jesus. He walked on water. He created wine out of water. He fed the multitudes. He created all the the fish as Peter was fishing. He didn't get anything all night. And then the Lord at his word said, put the net down the other side. And Peter had trouble bringing in the catch. And so the Lord is the cloud rider. He is Lord of the harvest. And we can trust him. Hence, we can, as this song says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, all you nations. His everlasting truth and kindness is for all generations. It's off an album called Adonai, and it's a combination of uh, many Messianic uh, worship leaders from the Galilee. 
and around Israel. And so the Lord calls all of creation to worship him. That's our response to him and to trust him in these times. So next week I'm going to continue this on and we're going to look at climate in the end times and particularly from the New Testament where mm. it's just even uh, more interesting. <laughs> so we can look at Romans 1 and uh, Matthew yes. 24 and the book of Revelation. Okay. Ruth, yeah. thank you very much for your company. Ruth, of course, is from the Tabernacle of David here in Bendigo. And you can hear Ruth again next Sunday at 2 o'clock. Now here on 105.1 Life FM, Bendigo's Positive Choice. It's